that you couldn't access online because they would be still within copyright in that country. The second question, you uh, showed us an example of country, the publication Country Life, where you had one unmarked and another one marked. Mm -hmm. Now, potentially, uh, for, uh, I'm thinking in that, that particular title, we also hold one that we see as highly significant because of the markings in it, and it's by a, you know, somebody who worked in our particular division. So when you draw the line as to how many copies you're going to put up, to me, there will be no line. If, if, if I have Ellen White's personal copy and he has Jane, Jane Andrews and someone else has an unmarked Christine copy, original, but has something weird on it that makes it also original. To me, we would have one entry in ADL saying country life, this is country life, but then we would have four, five, however many we needed examples of country life depending on the, what could be J you know, each copy could be of someone else's provenance or that type of a thing. To me, it's not only just providing um, providing access to the text, to the actual words, but also enriching our Adventist heritage by having all these different copies available. I'm sure many of us keep variant copies. I know at Andrews we do that. That doesn't mean all of the variants should be digitized, but that very capacity and that issue what ADL does, which is nice, is it lets the one you have that's significant and another one there all come together in one place, which is one more advantage of, of ADL. But, but in addition, I do think this is something, this is where governance would be important because part of the, the aim here would be so that we don't all duplicate resources endlessly scanning things which are essentially the same. Now, if there's a separate e edition or even impression uh, of, of certain books, there may be a case for that. But I think that we need to view this strategically, and certainly that's one of the reasons why the, the church is willing to support it, precisely on the basis that, you know, we don't need to have 50 scanning centers around the world. Uh, we, it, and indeed, it may be that some things could just be done on an ad hoc basis, uh, at an institution which has a unique copy of something especially that relates to the history of the church in that country or region. Uh, but I do think some kind of uh, information clearing uh, mechanism, whether that's a committee or, or however it would work, is necessary so that we don't end up duplicating resources but actually say these, these, are, sig these are significant. Um, but ultimately, if if an individual uh, member of the consortium, for want of a better term, a university, a college, or, or a separate, uh, say, an, a union or division office felt this is really quite significant because of the markings or because it's a different impression and we'd like to scan it, then, there's n then of course they're free to do that um, and then it could be suggested to the, also go on the ADL and, and just simply marked as a, as a variant. But I think some, it would be good to have avoid some kind of duplication of resources and be strategic in this. Any other comments or questions? Margaret. I had another copyright question. If you wanted to digitize something that was copyrighted, say by one of the university presses here in the United States, what would be the process of seeking um, permission to do that? I mean, if the institution itself wasn't going to be digitizing. Well, one thing that, you, that, that's what you'd have to do. There would have to be permission. Um, fortunately, if we think of our own institutions, you can deal with your institution if it's your institution that you're working on in, and uh, they can decide whether or not they're willing to do that, and if they are, and it's as long as we go through proper process, sure. And an example of that, you know, as most of you will know, most of the things on the Adventist Archive site are, are, are fairly old, but we recently put on uh, the history of the Hispanic work, and for that, the NAD held the copyright, and we asked them, and they said, yes, you can put it on, or even more, more re that was what, two years ago, Benjamin, um, and just in the last few months we put on uh, a copy of a history of the church in 
Lebanon that had been produced by the church there. Um, we asked them for permission and they took it through their administrative committee and voted it and said yes and so we, we added that. So uh, with recent things it still is possible um, but one does need to be quite cautious and I can tell you, I can, well I won't, but I could tell you a number of stories about um, thorny issues that have arisen with copyright from the periodicals that we have online uh, and I can tell you that there are the equivalent of virtual ambulance chases now uh, lawyers who specialize in finding poems, short stories, artwork that have been used without attribution in magazines uh, and then going to the author and saying I will sue to get you some money from this. Uh, so it is, it is, one does have to be very cautious. That leads back to the discussion about what standards do we do metadata in? because I know that Dublin Core has a permissions section. So if you put that online, you'd be like, this is where we got the permissions for it, all being transparent of this is where the provenance is and whatnot. Right. Right. And actually for items that are under copyright that I've had a request to scan or whatever, there have been many times where an author has even donated and said, we, we want this, I would like this to be scanned. I use a field in the MARC record to record that information, the date, and what the what the permission given was, what the, co the original copyright information is. I think it's the 541, 541 field. So I use that, and so we are keeping track of that, but yeah, it's not coming over to, to ADL, and that's a great idea. With the development of e-books, um, is there a chance that you may put links into the database that would go just direct to ebooks that are already out there? One more thing to think about in the future. I think this is a good, this is a point to, to address. Um, in the discussions over the last uh, sort of three and a half years, uh, there have been strong suggestions that we should try to create a really comprehensive Adventist digital library of everything published by Adventists. Uh, that would cause immense uh, political difficulties with the Adventist publishers uh, and we received very clear counsel from uh, very high quarters that it would not be advisable to, to proceed with that. It may become possible later uh, but at the moment, we, we receive very strong counsel, do the historic materials, because that can be explained and supported by church leaders and church members everywhere. And when one has made really good progress with that, then one could start to look at doing contemporary materials, including linking to, to e-books and so forth. But for the moment, um, we feel that uh, it's best conceived of as something that is doing rare and or historic material. Sabrina? Just to follow up on that though, um, the environment may be changing really, really quickly and uh, I hadn't intended to speak to the whole group but since the topic came up. Uh, my mother is a constituent member of the executive committee or whatever for the Michigan conference, sort of the lay person at the conference attends those meetings. And they're having conversations there on a regular basis about the ABC, the future of the ABC, the future of, pr of print sale books. And they're talking about going to sales of digital books and scanning digital books. And because I talked to her, she's aware of ADL, it seems to me that maybe some of these conversations need to be starting now for laying the future groundwork, even though that may be years out yet. Um, the, maybe a broader audience needs to know that we're working on this project. I, I think that's, that's true, Sabrina. Um, but before we do that, we need to have things at, at I think a more finalized and agreed stage. Um, and that, you know, once, it, once it's released, at, before we're doing it, before the GC session, in the hopes that an awful lot of people passing through uh, the White Estate and archives booths at the, the session will see it demonstrated for them, um, we did conduct very uh, 
very tentative, uh, make very tentative overtures to Review and Herald and Pacific Press. Um, and uh, were we to try to make it any more than tentative, uh, it, would, it would have caused a great deal of trouble. Uh, so it's true that uh, they are not the only, well, it is not, they're not the only Adventist entities that are publishing materials now because there's all kinds of entities that are doing it. Um, but nevertheless, it, 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 it behooves one to move with, with caution. We, the, the thing that we've wanted to be sure is that we have the capability, but realize that it's not, at this point, we don't want to do something that's going to create additional angst. It's hard enough for us right now to try to bring together the coalition and the connections to make the Adventist Digital Library happen. I think as that happens and as we go along with it, I think things will will develop and change. And you know, th there's a lot of support at literally the highest levels for doing rare and historic material because it's people can see the rationale and when we, the, the second lot of $75,000 that we received had to be voted through by the GC Executive Committee and Jim Nix and I were both ready to stand and speak to it and it went through without any uh, dissent because people could see the, the need. Once you start getting into current publications then there is the danger um, of people with high connections uh, going to the top and then suddenly you, you, we will find that we're being pressured not to do certain things to do you know, it, it, uh, it, it it's just best to move I think cautiously with the the material that everyone agrees is worth doing and which are in danger of being lost if we don't digitize them so questions here yes I'm curious about the unnamed photographs and the unknowns mm -hmm. you're probably using facial recognition software that you can go through vast collections and match people up you know there's a lot of that <laughs> on the web do you have plans to do that to identify the unknowns I think if we were if we were scanning and not cataloging we probably would, but how we work now is we don't scan until we're ready to catalog it. Okay. So we actually scan it, catalog it at the same time. If we were doing bulk scanning and then having to go in and, and create the metadata, and we've just and we've had discussions about that. Why are we cataloging each photograph? I mean, it, it takes a lot of time to catalog, and we could be doing big batches and having them show up in a photo album on the web. And it would be much quicker, and we could use the facial recognition software and that type of a thing. So, who knows what will happen in the future, but right now that's how we do it, is we actually right. catalog as we scan. We did have one fun thing happen. Uh, I was mentioning Madison and Julie kind of used that one too. When I went there last weekend, Albert Didis, who is one of the board members, had gone to this site, our site, which it's not ADL yet, but he had taken it from the car website because we mounted photographs for them there and he had printed out a couple of dozen pictures that he didn't know now he's a long time a Madison person and he said we're trying to understand about this so he put them on the gymnasium and you should have seen that place it was mobbed with uh, octogenarians and nonagenarians and we really had a lot of identification going on for those photographs so I have over 50 emails in my inbox from him okay. identifying the photos that we couldn't identify so it's a great thing and that's why we started doing this on our photos instead of saying not scanning it we would not scan things that we couldn't identify now we say unknown woman associated with Madison College for instance and then all the unknowns if you go to our photograph database you can click on an album that it takes that keyword either a question mark or an unknown in any of the fields that we catalog it will put it automatically in that album so you can go in and browse all these unknown pictures and we have had people that have written to us and said hey I know who that person is and it's a way for us who don't know we're getting more information from the public and each of the photographs has a section on the bottom that you can submit a comment yeah. okay, we're getting we need to quit here soon but Philip uh, some names have, have been, uh, in, the, uh, in the photographs, they have changed. Institutions and organizations and different, different contributing libraries assign different names on those 
uh, organizations, institutions, and even names of persons can change when they get married or whatever. Does ADL have any plan to assign, a, shall we say, a, an index terms to help our users? Otherwise, we have a lot of data or images, and our users may not be able to access them unless they have to follow this team. I'm not sure how to do it. We may be able to assign something that I'm just trying to see that the users will be able to access our images. They scan, but how to access them? And like for example, but Butterfree College, one library may assign Andrews University. I think we assign mm -hmm. assigns Andrews University, but another institution may use Butterfree College. And if we use Andrews University and the Marinda use Butterfree College, then there will be some uh, point to, to it's take time to access that uh, document. Mm -hmm. Did you get my question? Yes, I understand. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier. We're trying to develop a way where for each subject heading, we have alternates. That there is an alternate field in there that the database will check that as well. With entries coming in, it will check the alternates. And if it finds a match, it will assign the official subject heading for that, for ADL. I mean, it's not official. It may be the official Library of Congress one. but. Whatever, however we display it on ADL, it will assign that same one because we have to make everything automatic as much as possible. We'll run into it. Will it right now? Even I didn't really show it, but if he, all those Library of Congress subject headings, it wasn't pulling anything from the archives or from Ellen White, the Ellen White site because they don't have Library of Congress subject headings. So if I had clicked, I clicked that filter, it automatically filtered them completely out. So and that's something we have to fix somehow or make it very clear that this institution didn't participate in <laughs> that part or whatever, however we have to do it. But th there's a lot of work that has to be done. We're trying as much as possible at the beginning here to figure out a way to make it automatic. And that we do have this alternate names field in the database. So if you go into um, Jane Andrews, we show him as Andrews, comma, J period N. We show him as John Nevins Andrews. We show him as John N. Andrews. We have the, the official Library of Congress heading, which is the Andrews, comma, J, and parentheses, John Nevins, with the date. So all those alternate ways that the subject heading could have been entered, we're putting it in that field and hoping that it will catch most of the stuff that comes through. It's a, again, this is a big job, what we're trying to do here. There's a lot of work that has to be done. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm actually very excited that you guys are, are feeding back here and giving me ideas on how to do this. So any ideas, I welcome them. Last comment. Um, just following up on what you're talking about, um, we face a similar problem in our database, and particularly with some institutions who changed their title over time. What we ended up doing was putting the title of the institution and the date that apply to that name and therefore people can understand that when they put in a particular name, it's only going to apply to a particular period. Okay. Um, typically I have people turn up and say, oh, what's something about Avondale in 1956? Well, sorry, but Avondale didn't exist back in 1956, not that term. <laughs> the college did, but not that term. It was known as something else. Um, so that may be a solution for you. And I think this brings it around too to uh, all of us, get, the librarians specifically, getting together and with standard, an idea of standards of how to do this. Because going forward, we know we know what we want to do, and if we can all get together and say, "Hey, this is how we're going to catalog our subject headings or whatever," I don't know if it's even possible, but it's a, it's something to think about how we can how we can get a little bit more standard on what we're doing. So, for instance, like for um, Andrews University changed names three times, right? So what we do, I believe now, is we put all, depending on the time frame, we kind of put both of them, Emmanuel Missionary College and Andrews University. And, and it's, it's messy, frankly, because you have the duplicate with each name for, you know, buildings and campus scenes and all of that, duplicating over and over again. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for Questions, comments, uh, they've been duly noted.
and Paulette has a, a brief word to say. Very good. Okay, you've heard much today. Um, you've heard the chronology that has brought us to where we are today. You've heard many presentations about um, the vision for ADL and you've seen the beginnings of the database. And so you're sitting here and say, so what or what's next? And this evening, the SDA periodical index, crucial part of what happened with ADL, as well as the ALICE consortium, pretty much made up of um, the majority of library directors, certainly the library directors in North America, we will have a joint meeting. So many questions have come to the floor already, um, technical issues, even the vision. And so we're going to meet and we will prayerfully consider um, the decision to be made. This evening is our first meeting and tomorrow evening Alice will meet on its own and hopefully um, we will have something to report to you on Wednesday morning. Okay. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing, yes. Just to remind everybody, the meetings tonight are at the hotel. That's correct. It, at the hotel beginning at 7 p.m., what room number? That I don't know. I will find out as soon as I get back and have okay. a fire. Thank you. All right, so that's what we'll be doing. Please keep us in prayer. Thank you. It's time for a break since we're a little bit over.